Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's IndieSoft uh, webinar. Uh, today we're uh, having a very special guest, Mr. Rick Stone from Innovative Electronics. He's going to be presenting his iView system uh, with uh, covering petroleum drilling systems, uh, really kind of a neat, uh, very modular uh, application. He's going to be walking you through that and showing you some of the, the really neat uh, capabilities of that system. Uh, hopefully it'll spark some interest and spark some ideas either to uh, uh, take a look at innovative electronics and what they have to offer or uh, give you some ideas how you can uh, uh, work with some of the ideas that uh, that Rick shows and maybe implement those in your own IndieSoft application. Uh, as we get started, uh, if you don't know, uh, my name is Scott Cortier. I'm Senior Technical Sales with, uh, with IndieSoft. And uh, I'm going to cover a brief uh, overview of IndieSoft version 8 Service Pack 1 uh, that we released back in October. Um, we had a webinar and uh, I suspect that many of you uh, that have joined us today maybe didn't know that we had that uh, or didn't attend our webinar. So I thought I'd throw in some uh, kind of ideas of what uh, that product has to offer amongst all of the different features and fixes that we have in the product, just covering some of the highlighted kind of top level features that we have in the Service Pack 1. Uh, then I'll be handing things over to uh, Rick and he'll be reviewing his, uh, his project and product and um, then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. But I, I would uh, also like to ask that if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put those into the chat panel or the Q&A panel. We'll try to get to those during the presentation. So uh, what is new in version 8 Service Pack 1? Uh, well, among other things, and by the way, there's, there's a lot of things, a lot more things than just what I'm going to show here. Uh, in fact, if you're interested or think you might be interested, feel free to go to our website just at indusoft.com and download the release notes, and that'll tell you everything that's in the service pack, the features that I'm going to show here, plus additional updates and fixes. Uh, one of the really neat things is um, during the development, so this is uh, the IDE, the interface uh, for that, uh, which really kind of our development environment, uh, now supports global text-based finds, searches, as well as uh, document-based search and replace. So um, really large projects are, you know, there used to be uh, often time where, where maybe you want to find a piece of text and you have to manually go through screen after screen after screen and look for that. Well, now you can do a, a text find and it's going to find actual text uh, within every screen, within every document. So it could save you literally hours, uh, many, many hours, especially in large projects and the ability to uh, find and replace uh, uh, certain text in, in those documents is a, just going to be a great feature, something a lot of people have been asking for for a long time. Well, we finally went back and, uh, and put it in there. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what IoT View is, um, it's our Internet of Things or Industrial Internet of Things offering. It's basically IndieSoft Web Studio running on Linux or VxWorks. And uh, while we've got a good majority of the features from IndieSoft Web Studio in the product already, uh, it's not 100% complete, but it's getting close, and we're adding things all of the time. Um, one of the features that we've added in Service Pack 1 is support for the math worksheet. Uh, what you have to imagine is that running on Linux and VxWorks, we don't have VBScript support, because VBScript is actually a Microsoft-related thing. Uh, so, but we do have the built-in scripting language, and uh, now with the, the addition of the ability to run math tasks in the background, you get the ability to run your scripts and, and not only in the background, but with execution control. So in the execution field, you can either put a tag, a constant, uh, or some built-in scripting language in there to trigger when that's going to uh, execute or not execute. Uh, the really nice thing is, is that before we had this, uh, if you wanted script to kind of run in the background, you had to put that, that script on, on the screen that was open. Uh, and if you change screens, you had to duplicate that. So this gives you the, the ability to run uh, scripting in the background, which is, is really nice for this type of product. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, I, I did a webinar we have posted on our website, um, actually demonstrating the downloading of this, the, the data collection to a remote database. Uh, so feel free to take a look at the website and, and see how we did that. Uh, in addition, uh, we've also added some new commands uh, specifically for IoT View. Actually, these, uh, these commands have been available in IndieSoft Web Studio for a long time, uh, 
Uh, these are database related functions and now we've made them available in IoT View. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, uh, up until now, IoT View can log data to a, a SQL database, a remote SQL database, uh, primarily using the um, trend worksheets. So you just put your tag names in there and tell it where to log and, and it does it. Well, now you've got the, the flexibility to be able to use these built-in scripting commands to to send and retrieve uh, information to and, to and from uh, SQL databases. Primarily, if you take a look at this one, if you're not familiar with this command, it's really powerful, DB execute. Essentially, you point it to a named connection that you create, so a connection to a database that you've given a name, well, let's say MyDB, and then you build up a string and, and pass it that string, and essentially that string is your SQL command and then it passes that uh, to the database connection and onto the database and your result comes back uh, with the information that you've asked it for, could be uh, alphabetized, sorted, uh, uh, filtered, however you want it. Uh, this just adds uh, so much more power to the data uh, collection and um, just being able to pull information from databases. Really nice thing, especially on a, a really low end platform, maybe running on a device, a, a thing, if you will. The next feature is um, uh, as we've migrated most of our objects to HTML5 to be able to show up on what's called the Studio Mobile Access Client. Uh, that client, if you're not aware, will run on browsers that are HTML5 compatible on Android devices, iPad, other Apple tablets, uh, or other Apple devices. Uh, such as iPhones, things of that nature. So, so smartphones, tablets, uh, Apple, Android, uh, Linux, other devices, Macintosh, as well as Internet Explorer 11. Uh, we've had some of those objects, some of those higher end objects, like the grid object, the alarm object, the trend object, have not yet been available. Well, now there's a trend object uh, that uh, when you just put a normal trend or, or trend control object in a project, uh, you don't have to do anything special uh, when you run that project on a, uh, when you open it up in a, an SMA client on an HTML5 browser, you will get uh, a trend object there that has uh, uh, what most people have asked for feature-wise uh, cursor and, and showing the trend lines and, and things of that nature. So uh, it's kind of a, a one step closer to having 100% HTML functionality as we uh, have the SMA client. Uh, on there, so really good uh, uh, moving forward on that. Uh, another feature that we've added in Service Pack 1 is something that we call uh, custom widgets, and I'm going to try to simplify this for you. If you're not familiar with ActiveX and .NET controls, what they are is third-party controls that were developed by somebody else, and IndieSoft Web Studio is a container for ActiveX and .NET objects. Now, in order to configure those objects, they're standards. Uh, the ActiveX standard and the .NET uh, control standard. And, and how you interface with those is, is basically you give those properties, methods, or events. And uh, now but, but, but those ActiveX and .NET objects are Windows-based technologies. So when we're running these on Apple devices or Linux devices and you're not in the, the Microsoft Windows world anymore, uh, well, you, you can't run ActiveX and .NET. So, uh, we've had requests from customers for whether it be features or, or hey, I want to support this, this web widget that I found online. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that people are calling web widgets that are either Java, uh, JavaScript based or HTML or CSS based. And uh, what this feature has done, since there's really no standards that are forming around those, uh, this feature is giving you the ability to take some of those web widgets that you might find on the internet and be able to incorporate those in your um, uh, IndieSoft project. And again, since there are no real standards related to that, uh, what it's done is it, it allows you to define, you can see this custom widget uh, menu here. What it does is allows you to define your properties, your methods, and, and even poss or, or your events and possibly even your methods uh, and set that up with just a little bit of HTML and JavaScript programming to be able to tie that together and then really use any widgets uh, from the internet that you want to. Uh, you can embed those into your application and, and they don't have to be 
hosted on the internet, uh, you can take advantage of those features locally. Uh, you can see here some applications that, that uh, we pulled in some gauges and some trends and things of that nature that, that are running locally, but we're taking advantage of the HTML and, and JavaScript that are in those. So uh, feel free to, to uh, let us know if you're looking for that. Give us a call or shoot us an email. Uh, what I like to say is that uh, IndieSoft has, has always been kind of like the best tools and the best toolbox that you might find in a hardware store or maybe all of the tools in general that you might find in a hardware store, not just in the toolbox. Uh, and, and what the custom widgets do is kind of open up the front doors to the whole hardware store, and now we're uh, able to access the entire world through, through custom widgets. So a lot of flexibility uh, comes into the product with just this one, one feature. We've also added uh, quite a few new drivers in the product, and uh, you'll see some announcements coming here in the next few days about some some other drivers that we've added and updated, uh, quite a big list uh, I saw uh, coming out soon. Uh, MQTT, if you're not familiar with that, that's uh, being very well driven by the Internet of Things. Uh, it's a subscribe and publish uh, model, very um, lightweight and uh, a low overhead, so it fits the Internet of Things very well. Uh, we've got a Kawasaki robot driver, SNMP. SNMP is uh, something for managing networks. Uh, I've done uh, presentations on this uh, so that you can actually do some, some monitoring of, of network-based alarms. So uh, take a look at that driver and, and previous webinars that we've done. Um, the SITIA driver specifically uh, for Siemens and uh, their TIA products. And so, for example, here's the, the Siemens S7-1500. And uh, so lots of good uh, new driver uh, updates and new drivers. If you didn't know this, the drivers in Indie Software Web Studio are independent from the product. Uh, so you can mix and match versions. So uh, you, can, you should always go to the website and take a look for the latest version of the driver. Uh, take a look in the uh, driver manual and make sure that uh, the features or the things that changed are something that you want to implement. And if not, you can always stick with an older version, even in a newer version of the software. So. Again, the, uh, the drivers are independent from the product version, which is a, a very nice, flexible feature to have. Uh, another thing that uh, we have uh, in Service Pack 1 is a new add-on tool, and this is uh, something that uh, we find very exciting, especially in North America, is an import wizard for um, Factory Talk uh, ME or SE. So now you'll be able to take your uh, Rockwell, your, your Factory Talk ME or SE uh, view applications and uh, import those right into IndieSoft Web Studio. Uh, I've heard some reports that um, uh, some customers have saved 85%, an estimated 85% of their development time. So, for example, if they thought a project was going to take them 100 hours to uh, manually convert, uh, it takes them less than 15 hours to, uh, to do this. So, uh, really good time saver. And uh, for those of you who are system integrators out there, maybe uh, this is something you'd like to do to help your customers, well, uh, give us a call and let us know uh, if you're interested in this uh, add-on. So with that, um, I'm going to hand things over to Rick. So good afternoon. My name is Rick Stone. I'm with Innovative Electronics. Well, Innovative Electronics has been around for almost 30 years. We build electronic instrumentation for drilling rigs. We do ballast control systems and other kinds of things. But specifically today, we want to focus on what we call our iView, which is a sort of an HMI layer over our data collectors. And we have four or five different kinds of data collectors depending upon the application. We do this iView mostly is used on drilling rigs. It's installed on drilling rigs worldwide, offshore and onshore, and, and probably everywhere there's a, a, a place to drill a hole in the ground. Um, the point of this and the goal of this is a couple of simplistic concepts right at the beginning. The first one is that people work like 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Sometimes they're off for weeks or months between shifts and then come back. So we designed the system to be easily, um, for make the learning curve as flat as possible and make it as easy as possible to learn how to make it work and then go ahead and use it when you haven't used it for a while. The second goal may seem kind of trite, but the fact is is that people that look at these things all day long and then they go home and play Xbox with their son and they come back and wonder how come what they have at work isn't as cool looking as the stuff that they have at home with their son. 
So we've tried to provide a type of a display that is attractive and um, holds somebody's attention, and then we want to be able to give them information in a way that they can assimilate it quickly because things happen quickly on drilling rigs. I don't know um, the background of any of you, so I'm going to assume that I need to and should provide some basic information on what's going on. The driller, um, a simplistic, in a simplistic way, is trying to put a hole in the ground while everybody else is talking to him on the phone and interrupting them for other things. He's got to watch people on the rig floor and, and other kinds of things, and he's responsible for safety. In the meantime, he has to be able to drill a hole in the ground and do it successfully in some kind of a efficient manner. So our goal is to give him information about the things that he is concerned about. Usually there's, uh, in drilling a hole in the ground, you have uh, mud that's being pushed down the hole and returning, and you want to make sure you're getting back all that you've put down there. Um, you have mud pumps, and they're running some speed, and you have some pressures that you're concerned about. You want to make sure you know what's happening now, and it's nice to know what happened a few minutes ago in case something happened that you didn't quite get a picture of. So what I'd like to do this time is start with what we call the quick start. And the quick start is a way when you first come into the to the system the first time, if you don't know anything about it and you've got to set it up, maybe you're the technician or something like that, you can go through each one of these buttons. And if you can configure the system based upon these buttons, when you get to the bottom when it says configure trend export, you will have been able to set up everything that's necessary to run the system and have it work. So once the technician gets it set up, and by the way, this system is fed, uh, the iView is fed by, like I said, different types of data sources. In this particular case, it's a, it's a type of a DAC device. It can serve up to four of these devices on a rig um, so that the company man can have one tool pusher, can have one, they can be in different locations. Um, so getting back to the basic operation of it, there you'll see a couple of different kinds of gauges. You'll see a meter and then a, a digital gauge. And I've put the test on some of these. Test is what you know in the system, the in the soft as a zero to 100 actively changing pulse. And I put that on there so we can see some things and see how the system works since there's not a drilling rig going on and we can't necessarily um, have all kinds of things happening at the same time. So we'll start by saying that, like I said, the goal is to keep it simple for the operator. And if the operator comes on and he doesn't know what he's doing right away, he can go to the help button and it tells him where to look for the different ways to enable certain activities and what he can expect in the way of labels and um, what he can do to make things happen. And of course, if he needs to um, look at that anytime he can, it's right there, it's always there. So in this case, what we might want to do is look at this gauge here. So we can look at this gauge, and every gauge that you pick has the way to modify. It's kind of like a little applet. Um, you can pick the engineering units. You can pick um, what the input is, in this case it's test, but it could be temperature in or temperature out or something else like that. You can give it a name. Um, and uh, you can choose how many decimal points are there. So the basic where all this data information comes from is on the menu in the configure system. This is the overall input scenario of the system. This is all of the channels that are available or that are calculated, and those channels are displayed here in their, in their basic number coming from the data collector. And so this way you can get an overall view of the whole system in one place. Each of these channels have a name, and when you push the reset button, the channel names are put back to the names that they had when they came from the factory. However, um, if you want to change it and call it something else, um, Maybe suction tank, you can do something like that. And then once that name has been established and been put into the system, then when you go ahead to look at a, at a gauge, um, when you go ahead and look at the, at the input, you select the input, it was set for tank one, but not suction. And so that's the new name as far as the system is concerned as the operator is concerned. So he can, Somebody can go ahead and change whatever they want to call those inputs to whatever they want to call them, and that's what will be displayed on the system. And you can see here we do zeros, we can do spans, we can do offsets and spans. Also, you'll notice each gauge has its own um, trend device, and that trend device, trend display, has a, a period associated with it, so you can change that too. Um, so that everything you look at here 
you can select what you're looking at, well, except for the big gauge. Everything else you can select what you're looking at. Um, you can select not just how it's laid out, but you can also select what the alarms are. Now, for the case of this one, just for the purposes, I've put, um, the, the, like I said, the, the test is running, and um, you'll see this shows a 10, and it's moving around. One of the things I did here so that you can see is, is that when this goes into an alarm condition, it changes color. Um, it's, it'll start at green, then it goes to yellow. Well, I should will if I turn, if I turn the alarm off. Um, and then it'll go to red. And you'll notice when this one overruns here, there'll be a light here to in indicate to you that you've overranged that display, and it's not just at the end, it's really at the end. And you might want to review. Um, you might want to review what uh, what um, um, your settings are. So these gauges work throughout all of the screens. There's four screens that essentially have the same layout, only in different positions. But what's unique about them is each of the trends are unique for that screen. So you can actually have trend screens set up separately for each of these three different screens. Now let's take a look at the trends for just a minute. You'll see that we'll just use this one as a sample. It doesn't really matter. Well, maybe we'll use this one um, as a sample. Um, which one did I have set up earlier? Yeah, this one. So you'll see here that we are running um, actually three pins per strip. But if you don't like that, you can reduce it to one, or you can reduce it to two, or you can reduce, make it to three. That allows you to either watch uh, six or a four or eight or 12 variables. And each of those variables have their own zero and span. And the alarm is set so that if you go beyond the, um, if you go beyond what it's, what it's said to do, you'll get an alarm. The other thing about this that's kind of interesting is you'll see this zero down here. Sometimes you're looking at something and you say, well, um, what happened just a few minutes ago? Well, you can go back here in 20-second segments and go back and look and see what happened uh, some time ago, 100 seconds or a couple hundred seconds, to see what's going on. And then when you're done, you can put it back or leave it someplace, actually, for a while if you want to inspect something or talk about it with somebody. So here you can see now this is an alarm. And... You can see that this is the test and it's kind of tight right now, so we can go up and change the period on this particular one to um, maybe make it a little easier to see what's going on. So now we've stretched it out, and um, so you're able to see what, what the situation is. And this is useful, for example, sometimes when you're pumping mud down the hole, you have uh, total SPM. I'm going to turn the pumps on because they're off right now. When the pumps come on, you'll see these little circles light up here telling you that the pumps are active and running. Um, and when the pumps are running, you have a total SPM here, and you have a flow here, and you have a pressure here. And so you can watch these three variables. And in theory, if your pumps are running down hole and everything's fine, you should have some amount of flow coming out and some amount of pressure. If any of those variables change, you'll be able to look at any of those three uh, trend pens and be able to figure out what or hopefully have a clue that something's going on. So one of the things that's nice is you can actually look at these indicators, and each one has its own trend. So if you feel like you want to run a screen like this, then all of these have their own trends, and you can look and set them for, um, this is set for two minutes, but you could set it for four minutes, um, or whatever you want to do, so that you can see the results. Actually, you can turn it off if you don't want to see it, if it's bothering you. So what we, this allows you to do is to actually configure any of these gauges and meters to be able to configure them how you would like them to look. As I said, you can change the, the decimal points. Um, you can change the engineering units. Now, the engineering units um, are engineering units that you generate yourself. Um, because the data collector can be calibrated to, to any relationship, any, any zero and any span, what happens then is you have the ability here to determine and select and decide what the engineering units are that you're using. And if you want to change it, you can simply type in there and type in the change and make the change. 
and have a different engineering unit. Whatever you type in there is what's going to be available here. To select which engineering unit you want. These are these are kept the way they are. I, let me mention one other thing. Um, the system, of course, has this select language feature. Um, this is English. This is Spanish. We're getting ready to add another uh, language here shortly. But you'll see that the names of the gauges and the engineering units don't change. That's because those would be entered in the language of the people that are running the rig because those are unique things that typically oftentimes is for uh, unique only to that rig. So we don't try to presume we know what we're doing there. We leave it up to the operator to figure out how he wants to deal with, uh, with his gauges. A couple other things down here um, for these digital units. I'm going to click on this and you do 0 and 25,000 or whatever it is. That is the, the range of the gauge at that point in time. Um, and you can see it change when you make those changes and the alarms changes. And if the alarm is not disabled, then if there is an alarm in condition, it will alarm. Like I said, there's multiple pages like this. There's a couple other pages um, that are specific to goals. One is this page, which is uh, kind of like an electronic drill and recorder in a way. Um, it has the ability, I'm sorry, wrong page, this page. It has the ability to trend real time, or you can pick a date back at a time when you want to know back and go back and look at something. This doesn't stop the trending of and the date collecting of data. It simply isolates it and stops it. So you can go back and look at some period of time and some period of date and see what, what the data looks like back then and, and um, have a discussion if you need to or figure out what it is that's going on back there. And some people um, like to be able to have it overlap, but that confuses some people because like the yellow has gone into the green, so they can choose this, which says it's not going to overlap. It makes it, it doesn't look so impressive right now, but when you've got lots of data on the screen, sometimes that's useful, and so they can pull that down and then um, there'll be a, an indicator telling them that they've, they've run off into an area that they don't belong based upon that decision. All of these, all of these, like all of the gauges, all of these um, pins can select any of the variables that are available on the, on the system. I'm um, going back to some of the variables for just a minute. Let's look at what's on the, on the menu. Um, there's several things here. One of them is to configure the trend storage. This is where the trend data goes. Um, we use the proprietary method to run this system with. We also use um, the, a couple other kinds that we use for backing up to remote locations and things like that. But we have a, a situation in our case where this stuff goes all over the world and the people who are capable of running it aren't always capable of running it. So we try to keep it simple. It might be somebody in Bangladesh or it might be somebody in China or it might be somebody in South America or in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia or who knows where it'll be. So we have to assume that they don't know a whole lot and we want to give them as much help as we can. For example, right now we're storing the data to the data 944 location. If we were to change that to some location other than that, um, they would point out to us that we don't have, or that location doesn't exist and would we like to make it. If we don't make it, we end up with a message down here that says, just want to remind you, you're not storing any data because it has no place to go. So then we could go back here, and if we punch that button, then it's going to start storing it in the new location, which I don't want to do because right now that's the data that we want to look at is here. So everything's back to normal there. And we try to put helps and things in places um, where uh, the customer might want to do something, but maybe he hasn't done everything in the preparation to get that done. For example, here's on bottom not available. Say, well, why is it not available? Oops, close that always. It's not available because the wraps have not been set or the pipe is in the slips. Well, actually, the pipe is in the slips, and that's why they can't do anything. So um, there's those kind of helps throughout the system. Let's go to another couple of screens. We have a tripping screen, which is a screen that is used to trip in and out of the hole. Um, it has some unique features in that we can go into trip and this goes to stands fill and hole fill, which then those, those counters are controlled by um, the condition of the return flow. 
um, under what normal conditions, just counter A and counter B. Right now, counter A and counter B are not advancing because no pumps have been selected. So if we select a couple of pumps, then counter A and counter B will start advancing. And we can see over here that the pumps are running, so we should be able to see things advance here, and we can. There's a high alarm for that. There's a high alarm for the B. We can zero the B. We can zero the A. Up here we have each individual pump, how fast it's running, and we've selected two pumps, so that's the total of the two pumps. Here this is gallons per minute, and again, um, there's no total there right now, but there could be. And these results here can be displayed on any of these screens just by going to here and looking for, for example, um, what am I looking for? Uh, SPM total. So we could go here and look for SPM total. I'm sorry, total SPM. Here's total strokes. That's that one. Um, there is what am I looking for? Oh, here's total GPM. Hmm. Ah, I'm changing the name, not the input. Huh. No matter how well you know the system, that's why you have helps. Anyway, so we could take this to, uh, let's see, SPM total. And so that's there. And then we change this to SPM, of course. And uh, so then now that gauge is, is looking at um, the total SPM from here. So all of this can be looked at on any, any gauge anywhere in the, in the system. There are some buttons up here that show you if you're tripping, if you're waiting, if you're filling, or if you're flowing. Um, and again, here's the, the multiple pens. There's also a mud screen. This is for the mud tanks. There's a way to select, uh, usually they have certain tanks that the mud flows through when it comes out of the hole and goes back into the hole. It's called the active tanks. There's a total for that. Right now, if you look at this, you can see the tanks one through 10 are active and they're being totaled. And if we were to zero the gain loss, which is this right here, then if something changes, if perhaps tank one um, starts losing uh, barrels or something like that, that's noticeable here. It's kind of a of a vernier type gauge, and if you get too much of a change, you'll end up getting an alarm, and it will uh, remind you that something's not the way you want to be. Um, here is the applet for that. You can choose whether or not you want it to be in the in the total inventory. You can give it a name. Um, this is where it comes from. This is the number of decimal points. And so it, it, you can switch any of these to pretty much anything you want them to be. Talked about this um, and the different, the different screens there. Here's reports. Reports are set up so that you can select a pen. And there's four different four reports, which you can give them your own names if you want, but there's four different reports. You can select a pen. You select which variable it's going to be. Um, you can select the unit set it was going to be. You can select the offset and the span. And then if you update it, it changes over there. So now it reflects what you have, and it'll, it stores that in the report one, so you can make four reports like that. Then you can go ahead and say, okay, I want the report to start at a certain day, date, month, certain day, and a certain year. I want it to start at a beginning time, and I want it to be this long and this number of pages. And then you can print it to either a hard copy printer or print to a PDF. And of course, here again, we got PDF reports. That's what the, the location that it goes to. But if um, it's wrong, and it's not useful for anything when it comes up, it'll tell you that that location doesn't exist. Don't waste your time. Either enter it and make it happen, or, um, oops, that didn't work out right. Try it again. There we go. Start back to normal again, and now we could print this, and it will print it to a certain location. Creating a PDF report, please wait. It'll finish making the report. It actually generates everything, and when it's done, um, it'll finish up.
So there's also some some additional screens over here. Actually, the system is laid out to handle different size uh, screens. We don't know what the customer is going to have for his equipment, so we try to give him some reasonable choices. Um, here's a wide screen, and this includes this piece over here on the side. Now the customer, maybe he's got some work to do with a spreadsheet or something like that, or type some emails or something like that. Maybe the company man has some other work to do. He can still monitor and watch what's going on on the side, but he can do other work done, get other work done at this point in time while he's still monitoring the system. Maybe he doesn't have a wide screen. Maybe he has a square screen. Um, so this would end up being what he would have on his screen, and he would not have the benefit of that additional information on that side. Um, a couple other choices are that he could do an auto, which makes it to the size of the screen, whatever he does have. So we try to make this in a situation where um, the operator can can uh, use different kinds of equipment and it doesn't mess up um, doesn't mess him up. So if we go back to the menu for a little bit. Let's see what we haven't looked at. We've talked about this is configure the well information. This is where you would put in the information of what's involved with the well and what makes it unique. Um, and then when you use, go ahead and use your, your report, that information is put up here. It's also used on some other places. As I mentioned before, we use a proprietary um, format to store the data in this configuration with these trends. We do that for a couple of reasons. We've had customers tell us that they have uh, in systems where there's one file that is used for, for each well. Um, some of the problems they have is they forget to start a new file when they start a new well or they blow up the file halfway through the well, or when they try to port it, move it, or something like that, something goes wrong, or the rig computer shuts down, or whatever, and they lose the file. Uh, so for this case, we use, for this data storage in this particular instance, we use the proprietary program, and then we have a program we've written that will extract the proprietary and turn it into an uh, um, Excel file with all the proper labels and um, all the proper information so that the customer has everything he needs. We store some other things in that proprietary, like the status of the well. And um, like, for example, this is rig repair, and that's number 11. Well, it's stored in proprietary is number 11, but that's reconstructed when the, the spreadsheet, uh, when the piece of software um, generates that. And also, I guess I should mention here, um, let's see. Um, I remember how to do this. Embarrassing sometimes. Um, if we go here, no. Go back to here. So um, we have a situation here where um, well, I was going to show you something, but I forgot how to do it. That's embarrassing at this point, but maybe I'll remember later. Yeah, there we go. That's right. Um, so. <laughs> I have to even mind myself sometimes. So here is uh, a uh, bar that shows what the numbers are at that particular point. And is it along the edge? Okay. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I need, I need coaching. Um, so anyway, so this allows you to look at, even though when you're running the system, you can still look and see what a particular variable is at a certain place. So if you're running here and you know what all the numbers here, but you would like to know what happened at a particular time, you can click that time and you can watch and see what those numbers were at that particular point on the, on the uh, cursor. So that allows the customer to actually when he perhaps when he's in this kind of a mode here and it's stopped, he can actually go down and try to see what this value is right here, and he can click on that and try to get to see exactly what went on at that exact time in history. Instead of trying to line everything up, he can just look through and, and decide what those numbers are on his own. Um, what else? Let's go back to the main menu. Um, so we talked about trend storage. We talked about well information. We talked about configure the system. The other things in the system is that this configures the volume 
and the efficiency of the mud pump for the gallons per minute calculation. Um, this is the variables that are used that are set into the data collector to know when we're going to be in drilling mode and what's important in the way of minimum weight on bit, minimum drill pressure, empty block weight tells us the wraps are set. Um, also, there's a way to reset all the meters, the zero and spans to factor reset, zero all the alarm values, and also reset all the labels. So, and this is actually down here is a little thing that we can do where we can look and look at the variables coming in from the data collector without going to the data collector. Um, all of these systems are set up to be able to have their software installed with them that allows us to sign on if there's a problem where we can help the operator solve this problem and there's also circumstances where if there is a problem um, and the red line shows up here like the, the message showed up that we didn't have good enough, didn't have a proper location to data storage, that will immediately send an email if it's online to our office and we can be aware of what's going on. It may be that we want to call the customer and say, are you okay? Is everything fine? How can we help you? So, and it also allows us, it sends other information at that time so we can be aware of what's going on and sometimes we've discovered that we've either overlooked something or that the customer is doing something that we didn't expect, that we didn't anticipate, and we would like to be able to address that on future systems. Um, also, there is uh, this called uh, configured data sources. As I mentioned, our data collector can service up to four of these servers at the same time and we call them servers because in every case they're able to serve information either to the internet and or to other uh, browsers on the on the rig, rig using this email address or this IP address, or onto the internet using that IP address. And the difference between some of these is we have the master server, and the master is the one that you can do everything on. That's usually the one that gets installed in front of the driller because it allows you to zero gain loss, zero weight on bit and do other kinds of things like that. If you go to one of them that is not maybe the company man's or the tool pushers or something like that, those functions are not available because you can't have, it's not good to have more than one person zeroing the bit weight or changing things that the driller is concerned about without his knowledge or approval. So there's four of those. Each of those four can actually serve uh, around the rig and they all store the data. So even if one goes down, um, yet the data is being collected by the other three, if there's three on the rig or two or whatever, if there's more than one. So in that case, the proprietary is, is whole all the time. The system will also receive information from different types of stuff from MWDs. Um, it's a Modbus compliant device. If uh, some gas detectors are Modbus and other kinds of things are Modbus 2 sensors and stuff on hydraulic rigs. So we can collect up that information using um, this IP address here and depending on how the, the system is set up for the customer, you can see here that now this is on and if we go here and we go up to um, the menu and go to the configure system, um, there's additional inputs that have be, be come up here because um, this particular rig might have a gas system and this is unique to this particular rig. Maybe a different rig might have a different option or a different feature here. We are, we are um, not the big guy in the field, we're the smaller guy in the field, and so I, I like to think of us as, as a, a boutique type um, electronics company in that we try to solve the customer's problems that other people either say can't be done or buy the system the way it is because it's good and you got what you deserve and you're not important enough to make any changes on. It does cause some excitement sometimes because we have to look very carefully at our quality control and being able to do proper testing to make sure that what goes out to the field is, is as correct as possible. So, okay. So, um, let me get there. Let's go to the next one. We have another thing called, uh, well, configure data sources. We did that. And we have configure mass variables. This one is a situation where you can take two variables and make a third, and, and it's called um, some one, some two, some three, or differential one, two, and three, those variables um, show up here and can be looked at on a gauge. So here's SPM and, and those, but then there's also differential one, two, and three, and some one, two, and three, and they can be renamed, of course, here 
and this we can take these channels and name them if you want. So that allows you to build your own channels from different kinds of things um, that you might that might be important to you to know the difference or the or the sum of them. Um, the system will do widths. This is actually this particular package here will do widths zero page. It's usually used by loggers and people like that. You can tell give it what IP address it is, and it will do it will also do serial widths. Um, but most people nowadays are doing the TCP IP widths. And you can give the name of the company who is the people they are so that you know what's going on. You can give it how often it's a push, so you can say I want to do it every second, every five seconds, whatever you want. We were doing one um, and they couldn't take a second. In fact, they couldn't do anything more than five seconds because their program was, that's all it could do. So then you can tell it I want to do that and at that point in time the system will start sending out the width signal. Uh, over the TCP IP um, for the whoever it is that the service company needs to do that. There's a thin client set up. Again, we have a situation where we don't know anybody that knows anything and we assume they know nothing. And so we try to provide as much information as we can to help them out. We know it's in the manual, but nobody wants to hear, go look at the manual. People want to be able to push a button and see something. If after they've gotten all that, they still don't understand it, they can send us an email or they can go look at the manual, but we try to provide as much information as we can so that they can solve their problem in a hurry. Um, if they got a problem, they don't want to wait and look at the manual, they want to fix the problem. So we try to help them do that. A couple of things that are available over here, you can see the, the, the little indicator here. These are all green. Um, if I acknowledge them, then they go away. Then as soon as one comes back, there's a, 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 a Intermediate alarm, they've turned red. If you acknowledge them, they turn yellow. Um, if they go away, they turn green, and they'll stay there until you acknowledge them. That way, the man doesn't have something happen to him and go away, and he didn't pay attention, and he didn't know what it was. This will tell him what's there until such time as, uh, as he acknowledges them, at which point they go away. Um, a couple other things that are available here is what we call rigware. Rigware will tell you whether the pumps are running or not, which pumps are running, one, two, and three are. Um, it will tell you the last time you reset this hours on it, and usually these are triplex pumps, so they have three sleeves. Um, oftentimes they'll switch sleeves in the middle of the pump hours. They'll stop the pump and put larger or smaller sleeves in to accomplish a pressure or a volume change that they want. So they can reset the time and date, and when they do that, What's happening is this goes to zero and a new time and date gets put in there so they know when they did that. There's the daily hours on the pump and the previous 24 hours on the pump. And there's also total bit wear for the drill bit and that can be reset also and it tells how many hours this day and how many hours of yesterday and how many hours the previous 24 hours. And the same with the thousands of RPM for the um, bit. Line wear, which is really ton miles, um, which allows you to uh, know how many ton miles that you've had the last 24 hours. And the previous 24 hours, it updates every day at 12 o'clock. Um, and then you have cut and slip, which is a ton mile situation where you say, I don't want to put more than a certain amount of ton miles on my, on my wire rope. So I can put a number in here of, we'll say 40 or some number like that. And then when that reaches 40 ton miles, it will give you an alarm message pointing out to you that you have um, that you've exceeded that number and you probably want to do something about it. You can see when the whole wheel gets replaced, you can actually enter the Derek Certified if that's important to you. Um, there's a tour. This is a 12-hour tour. Usually at the end of 12 hours, the customer wants to record something. Um, and so he does here. And then if he looks at the last 12 hours, he has this. And he looks at the previous tour, he has this. Um, I should like to mention we can do IADC, P, IADC, IADC um, reports. They, um, we just have to be told that that's what the customer wants and we can integrate that. It doesn't come standard with the system. Our systems are built in such a way that we try to make them economical for the, for the people who have the smallest rigs and the least needs. And then um, we can use building blocks both hardware and software wise to um, increase the customer's capabilities to pretty much MWD and other kinds of inputs that they want. What we're talking about right now is just a basic system. So if we want to go drilling, what we would do is um, 
we're say we're at 2,000 feet and the bit depth is at 2,000 feet. So we're in slips right now. So the reason we know we're in slips is because the the um, the hook weight is too low. So if we bring up the hook weight, now we're not in slips anymore, and we could actually run the block up and down. Um, I'm doing this by hand because the guy that was with me had to leave. But anyway, block up and down. And so then if we um, we want to go into the drilling mode because of the bits going up and down. If we want to go into the drilling mode, we say we want to go into the drilling mode by going on bottom. And what do we know? The bit weight's too low to go into drilling mode. So we need to pick up the bit weight. As we do that, now we're drilling. Now, when we go down, well, let's go up a little bit. We'll make this 2,000. Oh, look at that. See, there's a message. Can't make it 2,000 because we're on the bottom. So we go off bottom, set this for 2,000 because we're in standby. that, go back on bottom, bit way slow, pick the bit way up. Now we can start drilling again, and you'll see as the bit goes, the bit depth goes down, the hole depth goes down with it. So it's kind of simple, but yet that's that's the concept, and we try to provide a mimic there so that is as the driller is drilling. He can get a clue or a feel of what's um, going on on the rig from pictorial, pictorial standpoint, not just um, some numbers. Um, you'll see that when he's in the drilling mode, he gets to see torque and ROP and um, bit weight and all three of those on this on this trend screen here, um, all at one time, which helps them figure out what's going on. He can check the ROP that he wants to have, feet per hour or meters per hour. And in fact, the system, you'll see down here, says feet, but that's controlled by the data collector. So if you don't tell the data collector you want meters, then it's done in meters and everything is recalculated for meters. A couple other things. Um, because we talked about the fact that here's the trip screen and here's the drilling, the pump control, you can't always go back here. You may not want to go back here to control all these buttons. So there's a little button arrangement here on the side that says, okay, this indicates that three of the four pumps are running. This indicates that SPM one and SPM or pump one and pump three tell SPMs are being totaled. Gallons per minute are being totaled on pump one and two, and and counter A is being totaled on pump one and counter B is being totaled on pump uh, on pump one and two. But you can change that from here without having to go back to the screen here. So there's a multiple places where you can make those decisions. And so because these variables can be displayed on other windows, um, this is put over here and you can actually zero A and B. Um, so that's, uh, that's how that works. Um, I don't think, I can't remember now what I've told you. I've showed you how this works where you can change the number of pens. I think I've showed you how we can step this back. I did this at 8 o'clock this morning, and now I'm beginning to wonder what I told them and what I told you. So I'm just kind of going through this, um, maybe for my own purposes, to remember what kind of things I've mentioned. Um, does anybody have any questions at the moment? Rick, hi, this is Scott. Uh, currently, there's no questions, but uh, just for the audience, if you have questions, put those into the chat panel or the Q&A panel and either for, for Rick or myself, and uh, we'll, we'll get those answered. Rick, uh, I'll tell you what, I completely understand. I, I teach so many training classes and, and sometimes back-to-back -back weeks uh, that I have to stop myself and go, did I already tell you this? Uh, so I completely yep. understand. <laughs> so here's, here's a case where, like, in the tripping, you can't do tripping, and it'll tell you why. Tripping is blocked out. If you go off bottom, Okay, then you'll see this goes back to bit weight. Actually, we can set this to auto, so it's in hook right now. When we go back on bottom, it'll go back into the, to this mode. We're not drilling right now because the bit weight's low. But so there's some buttons here that you can um, choose to make happen. And when you're not on bottom, then we can go into the tripping mode. 
um, and then this screen becomes active. And then we're tripping right now. We know that we're flowing because of mud flowing. And so there's indicators there, and those indications are also stored so that if somebody needs to know what's going on later, um, that can be taken care of. We talked about, um, um, let's see, gain loss here. And so the gain loss was a function of all of these. The total is a function of all of these tanks here. So if we go back and look at the, at the um, oh, which one was I on? I forgot, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so I forgot which screen I was on. So we'll go to here. So there's gain loss, and it's uh, set right now so you can zero it. Those are things that the driller would do. Those, those buttons are not available when the, um, when the system is in a client server mode. So um, we talked about the fact that there are some kind of alarms under some kinds of conditions. And in fact, if I actually shut off the, um, the uh, data collector, then the system is waiting for more information. And ultimately, it won't get more information. And so there'll be a message that'll come up. And these messages, like I said, they'll come up in these, in these locations here. If the rig is, in, is online, they will be sent to us. And um, we will know something's going on. And uh, oftentimes, we'll check with the rig, or they'll come right back up again. And we realize they're just maybe changing the holes or doing something. And so they, they um, but we, we like to know what's going on for a couple of reasons. Mainly is because maybe there is a problem that they have that, that's, that's going on. Now, see, here's a case where we need to set wraps, which tells the drilling rig where the block is, because when you first start things up, the rig doesn't know where the block is. And so it needs to know what's going on. So we tell it to put the block on the floor. You have to be in slips um, in order to do that. Once we're in slips, then we can set wraps. And actually, that can actually be done from here. You can determine how many wraps are on the drum. I don't mean to bore all of you, but those of you that know, know and what we're trying to do is tell, tell the rig, tell the system right now how many wraps are on the drum. And the wraps are set now, so he knows as the drum increases wraps and decreases wraps, um, the data collector knows the parameters on the rig, the drum diameter, number of lines, things like that. So he knows how then to move this block up and down in a way that, that um, represents what's actually going on in the rig. So i um, trying to think what I may not have covered. We talked about reports. We talked about um, this guy here. Um, what else did we do? Configure main variables. We talked about widths. We talked about thin client. We talked about this, 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 and this. Um, I guess that's how much time do we have left? Yeah, we're running close. So, so I guess um, unless you got other questions, I'll consider myself done. <laughs> Rick, thanks. Uh, why don't you, uh, while we're uh, still on your screen, uh, put up information on how to contact uh, you and your company. Thank you. And uh, just as I did this morning, I'm going to uh, just kind of compliment you on uh, everything that you've done. I, I learned something new. Uh, this afternoon compared to this morning, too. And I, I'd also like to compliment you on it really looks like there's a lot of experience in your application. And I, I'd like to, uh, you know, tell the audience that uh, it, it's kind of neat to see how you've used some of the features that we have in IndieSoft Web Studio. Uh, if, if I could have you just briefly go back to one of the screens with the trends on it. Um, I, I like the fact that you've you've used the trends that are rotated 90 degrees and have the time on the on the y-axis as opposed to the uh, x-axis um, yeah that'll work right there uh, so the time is along the side as opposed to along the bottom a lot of people don't realize that's just really kind of a checkbox configuration in IndieSoft Web Studio and it, it can either be uh, the the to represent how the the actual data is being logged is, is represented in the real world uh, or it's just a little bit more convenient to put it that way, or if it's referencing as a paper strip chart recorder. I also like that you have the communication status in there along the bottom, just the overall 
modularity and configura uh, configurability, the screen scaling for different size uh, screens and resolutions. That's uh, that's really neat how you did that. I like to I like to see that type of stuff. So uh, uh, as as this morning, my compliments to to you and your team. Uh, looks really well, I'd nice. I'd just like to mention one other thing. Frankly, uh, it's the flexibility. We like we like studio, and I'm, you're not asking me to say this. I'm just voluntarily in it. But we like studio because of the flexibility. When you see to be able to do things like this, and have everything move around, or do things like this, where where the times change and and all the buttons and things like that, um, or 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 doing these kind of things here, where we can switch between different kinds of screens, and and to look at the flexibility that we have to be able to just do all kinds of stuff. Um, with few exceptions. Oh, I didn't mention too that this this does do mobile access. It'll it'll go to remote uh, browsers and it'll also do go to smartphones. It's set up to do that, though you can't see that here. Um, but but we we really appreciate the flexibility, like the ability to put these little mimics here that actually represent what the screen looks like. So if you're wondering what your screen is going to get, you can look here and you can represent those gauges represent what's here. So anyway, I just want to mention that we, the flexibility, we try to use that as much as we can. We want the customer to feel like he actually paid money for something valuable. And a lot of times people measure the value of something by how it looks when they look at it. And these people have to look at it all day long every day. It should be pleasant for them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, I don't see any questions coming in uh, to the audience. If you have any questions, put those in the chat panel or the Q&A panel. Uh, we'll try to get to those. Uh, uh, Rick, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take back presentation status from you. If you don't mind, put okay, your yeah, put no your questions, contact. Either did awful good or awful bad, I guess. So. <laughs> or, or people just haven't had enough coffee. Uh, sometimes that's, that's the it. case. Anyway, so. thank you for giving me a chance to do this. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Sure. There's a uh, little bit. I'm going to leave uh, Rick's contact information up there if you need to get a hold of Innovative Electronics, if you've got a a drilling application, uh, or if you'd like to contact them. Uh, there you go. And so now I'm going to take back presentation status here real quick, and we'll keep it open for uh, questions while I'm going back to the uh, IndieSoft presentation here. And, uh, okay, we got that uh, going on. So, again, still open for, for Q&A. If you've got that, then I'll leave the, the contact information up there for IndieSoft. Did you for see Indusoft. the question about the screen resolution? Uh, I didn't see any questions come in, honestly. So I thought uh, I saw one. Oh, so there we go. Yep, the there screen. is one. It just it did. It just came in. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll give presentation status back to you. Give me just a second here, and click on a couple of things, and there you go. And we're getting a thank you from the person who asked that. Uh, so Rick, you should have uh, presentation status, and uh, don't forget to share your screen again. Okay, yeah, we got your good. screen. Go ahead. Yeah, there is there is some commands that's kind of cumbersome, and I could go over it to somebody who wants the details. But the idea is that unlike some place where you put something on some process plant or something like that and everything is fixed and decided, we're in a situation where we don't know what kind of computer is going to end up running this thing sometimes. We don't know what kind of screen it's going to be. So we did a wide screen like this. And one of the advantages, as I said, of the wide, of any of these kind of screens is there's places for the customer, like I could be watching the rig right now, and I could also be building a, a PowerPoint package, and if there was an alarm, I would get it. And so I could, I could do my work and still be able to monitor what's going on on the rig. And so then another choice might be a square, we call it a narrow, but it's a square screen, you know, the older styles of 15 inches and 17 inches and things like that that are square, and this matches that. And that helps them because sometimes auto doesn't work right. If you do auto with, a, with a, a screen that's kind of cumbersome, it'll come up leaving the bottom short or something like that. Then there's a, a 1920 uh, by 1080 screen, which looks like that on, on my screen anyway. And then um, you can go to the, to the 1080 by, uh, by 1975, which is another one. And then ultimately there's some auto. But those commands are all commands that are within Indosoft, and you have to you have to look for a couple things to do that, but it works very good. And we do that simply for two reasons. One is we can't predict what the screen is going to, what the screen they're going to be using. And also it allows them to be able to multi-use this, uh, this, uh, um, this, this, this screen to be able to do other things with it too. So now I'll give it back to you. 
hope that answers the question. Rick, Rick, thanks for that answer. Hopefully the, that answered that person's question. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to say that if you're not familiar with some of the, the intricacies of configuring IndieSoft Web Studio, that uh, there is an auto screen scale, and it will try to make the screen as large as it can without distorting the objects. Uh, that's one. Uh, also, you can span multiple screens. You can configure the resolution to be as small as 240 by 240 and as large as 10,000 by 10,000 or anywhere in between. So uh, you can span multiple monitors in kind of an extended desktop uh, situation. So uh, you could have two, uh, kind of one side by side of each other, uh, four, uh, kind of in a two by two. You can do a, uh, lots of different things there. Um, the largest that I've ever seen has been eight 70-inch monitors ganged together in a big video wall. It's really impressive. Uh, so again, lots of flexibility there. Um, if you uh, uh, have more questions, get a hold of us uh, at, at one of these contact numbers that you see below here. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, please let us know. And uh, feel free to uh, uh, let us know how we did in the survey. And uh, you'll be seeing uh, some follow-up uh, survey information in the days to come, as well as uh, 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 things like uh, uh, give us your, your shirt size. We're going to send you a free T-shirt just for joining us. And um, uh, we really appreciate you having uh, taken the time today. And Rick, I'd like to thank you. Really appreciate you doing this, uh, taking the time out of your busy day. Thanks again, Rick. Yep, thank you. All right, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and uh, join us again for another webinar and uh, usually uh, Wednesdays and uh, uh, let us know what, what you'd like to see in the future. Let us know if you'd like to co-host a webinar with us. Thanks again, everybody. and uh, have